geht durch die Welt ein Geflüster. Arbeiter, hörst du es nicht? Das sind die Stimmen der Kriegsminister. Arbeiter, hörst du sie nicht? Es flüstern die Kohle- und Stahlproduzenten. Es flüstert die chemische Kriegsproduktion. Es flüstert von allen Kontinenten. What's up, guys? Um, we are doing this video today. Uh, primarily, I'm going to be talking about um, Hillary Clinton um, and, of course, the Republican incumbents, if we can even call them Republicans anymore. I think we ought to call them Nazis, but whatever the point is. Is basically getting to that point where it's primary season and we're already getting close to that halfway point in the year where we're starting to where the US bourgeois elections are around the corner now before I even get into the thing because I'm going to talk more about Hillary Clinton than I am about the other guys First of all, Rand Paul is running. A guy that claims to be this anarcho-capitalist, libertarian sort of dude, but is completely despised by most libertarians, is completely, you know, continuously has regular, I would say, consistently has regular arguments with his own father, because his father and him do not see eye to eye, because his father represents the old guard, his father is a libertarian, and Rand Paul thinks that he represents some new age Republican Party, some new age sort of betterment of the Republican Party, when in actuality Rand Paul is a Tea Partier, and basically represents everything that is fascist and wrong with the American right. And then we can talk about Mark Rubio, who Marco Rubio, who's a Republican running for the presidential nomination, who says that he is better fit to run, that he is somehow able to run this country, that he thinks that he could run a country, that he he's somehow got the chops to run this country. Okay, you are a senator from Florida what makes you think that you can run a country now albeit I got a lot of criticisms I could make about Hillary Clinton and frankly there are going to be a few addressed here such as the fact that she that she and the entire Obama administration horribly handled the, Lib the Benghazi situation and in just in general flubbed up the entire situation in general considering the fact that they sent that they sent NATO troops imperial you know US imperialism right into Libya and basically paid the price for it in which Libya became a failed state in fact that is why it is probably because of wholeheartedly because of them of why Libya is now broken up into the uh, factions that it is, the, you know, controlled by ISIS, controlled by the old Gaddafi forces, controlled by, you know, what minuscule numbers there are left of the old National Transitional Council, the, you know, and these other warring tribes and stuff like that. It is so heartedly pretty much the fault of the U.S. government for basically getting rid of Gaddafi in the first place. Was Gaddafi perfect? No. Was Gaddafi a socialist? Not really. But at least he, like Saddam Hussein, he kept the wolf at the door. And that's not trying to somehow say that Saddam was was a great leader and that Gaddafi was a great leader. It's like trying to say that Assad is a great leader, and they're not. But 
they're better than, but they're the lesser of the two evils. And when you compare them to the U.S. imperialism, they are definitely the lesser of two evils and kept the wolf at the door. They, you know, kept out, you know, this capitalist influence. They kept out uh, any sort of, you know, they had a pretty good shot of self-reliance on their country's side and they made and that's ultimately what their regimes were about and why they were opposed by western imperialists but ultimately when we look down at, at Hillary Clinton she is probably out of the two out of the two, and out of the two I mean the two bourgeois parties the two bourgeois dominant parties the you know liberals versus conservatives or out of the two, she is the best suited to run the country. If you are talking in the sense of bourgeois democracy and for the sense of humoring the bourgeois, we will definitely say that Hillary Clinton is the lesser of two evils. Because she is better to run the country, because she has probably done more than most, than any Secretary of State has ever done for this country, probably, I would say, since about the oh, I don't know, the War of 1812, at the very least, if not the entire history of the U.S., she's probably one of the, I would say, top three secretaries of state. She has brought great, had, has strengthened our relations with other countries that we were already allies with, i.e. Western imperialism. She's strengthened our, our resolve with countries like Japan. She tried to strengthen relations with China. She tried, tried to strengthen relations and economic ties with these different countries. She strengthened relations to, with Saudi Arabia. Um, for, you know, they, we've even through her have begin, had begun to put the building blocks in place for talks with Iran. Now eventually that got carried over to the John Kerry administration which frankly I find ineffective at, in just about every sort of thing there under Secretary of State and pretty much had to be thrown on Obama's back to actually be you know actually show that you know Obama could actually be a president and not just sit back and be a fucking figurehead and take up all this you know Kennedy like hype and all that bullshit a acting like he's the fucking king of the US Although we can make the argument. The um, point that I would really like to make here, though, is um, I, I kind of really do think that Hillary Clinton, out of the two, is definitely more suited. And that is coming from a person who does have a Marxist Leninist line. If I, do, if I were to vote in a boot, participate in bourgeois democracy, I'll probably vote for Hillary Clinton just for the sake to say one day, yeah, I voted for the, I voted for the fucking, I, I voted for, for the first female president of the United States, and just to piss off the Republicans. But ultimately, I would probably vote for just for the sake of having that knowledge that, yes, I did vote for the first female president, just like I, you know, I supported Obama before my radicalization. But that would be the only real reason I would vote for Hillary Clinton. And if you are definitely Democrat, I would, you know, go ahead and vote for her. If you're a Libertarian, probably your better choice. And the way I see it, I think Hillary Clinton is better suited. And I think the Republicans know that, because they have very weak candidates. I mean, Ted Cruz, are you fucking kidding me? Ted Cruz is the son of a Cuban immigrant, and he was born in Calgary, Alberta. And the last time I checked, I don't believe that you can be president unless you were actually born in this country. Now, you can probably use, well, I was born on a military base. No, you aren't. You were born in Calgary, Alberta. You were a Canadian and the son of a Cuban immigrant. And yet you play this, oh, this Texas Republican, this... American sort of thing oh so well despite the fact that you are a Canadian and that's no jab at Canadians it's no jab at people who are of Cuban descent and it's not trying to be a jab at Texans although I could make the argument that I could 
and I could easily make many jokes about Texans, but that's not relevant, nor is it professional. But the point is, is that Ted Cruz is trying to was trying to say that he was wanting to run for president when he has no qualifications and is probably the worst suited person to do that. I mean, if we look back at his track record, what is he probably most what is his most greatest achievement? I would say the one probably getting you know the ignorance and the and the stupidity of people in Texas to vote for, in the San Antonio area to fucking vote for you. And to the fact that you owe, just for the sake of argument, you know, that $24 billion that you fucking cost the United States when the government shutdown happened. Yeah, did we all fucking forget about that? This is the man that caused it. Marco Rubio is a per and Rand Paul and all these other idiots in the Tea Party were the people that fucking caused it. You know, and it's like, well, Obama, Obama. Obama had nothing to do with it. Obama's only plight was the fact that he was trying, that he, that he got, was lucky enough to get through this bourgeois concept of universal health care. A universal health care system that was deeply flawed and fucking retarded. But frankly, the fact of the matter is, is that the only reason that the government shutdown happened was because the Republicans' whole thing that they were trying to do during the entire friggin' thing was to cut down the Affordable Care Act, to bring down Obamacare. It's socialist. We gotta bring down Obamacare. Forgetting that Obamacare was actually deeply corporatocratic. But it's the very essence that they focused so much saying, oh, this is socialism. We gotta tear down this socialist fabric. It's gonna, it, it's ripping apart, it'll rip apart the very found traditions of American policy. Yeah, American policy also used to dictate that we that slavery was legal. It used to say that child labor was okay, and that basically broke the backs and eventually killed the immigrants from China and Ireland who had come over to this country because they were fucking starving to death or hooked on fucking opiates. The only reason that the U.S ever came up with any sort of thing saying, oh, we should change these laws, oh, we should do this, we should do that, we, we should come up with these reforms, is because eventually pe people realize that the insanity and inhuman nature that capitalism causes. Now, granted, they didn't un actually understand that this is the inherent nature of capitalism, and that's what capitalism does, it exploits, and then, quite honestly, if it actually could work in its internal, its entire favor, we'd still have slavery and we'd still have, you know, the child labor and we'd still have different things going on that we do, you know, that we used to have and stuff like that and even to this day still find ways of getting around. The only difference is it's not happening in this country, it happens in countries like Bangladesh, <coughs> Walmart, <coughs> Nike, <coughs> Old Navy. <coughs> so anyway, the point is, is that these men are not suited. These Republican tards are, are not fucking suited to run a country. When their entire fucking policy the last eight years has been to try to s just stalemate and block at every angle the Obama administration and to try to make Obama look bad. That is the only thing that their party platform can probably have on its roster. It's not even, you can't even call this any sort of conservatism, it's just insanity. It's completely and utter bullshit. The Republican Party's platform has basically, pretty much since Obama got elected, and pretty much since 20, even in 2012, their party platform is, we have to, is that we want to beat Obama. We have to beat Obama. We will beat Obama. We will bring down, o and then Obama won. So what was their party platform? We're going to bring down Obamacare. We will bring down Obamacare. Obamacare will not be around. And Obamacare is still in place. 
and then they're trying to say, and now it's all about because now that they've got a little bit of power in the in Congress, now they're trying to basically say, well, we're just going to keep on, you know, we we've got to do whatever we can to stop Obama's policies. We've got to stop the Democratic policies. So we're gonna, you know, so anything that has to do with gay marriage, we're gonna we say no. If anything that betters women's rights, we're gonna say no. You know, it's no, no, no. And continuously beating that childish hammer like the fucking little five-year-olds that they are. But ultimately, what is the party platform? To basically get back at the dem to basically pretty much stab the Democrats in the back. I mean, they will even go against their own... Republicans will go against their own interests as long as they could fucking stab the Democrats right in the back. And in most cases, completely betray their own country. I mean, 47 people, basically, were trying to sign a fucking bill behind the president's back to try and stop the Iranian negotiations, and even now are stalemating Iranian negotiations because they will not lift the fucking sanctions. So you see, this whole process is the fact that they have the opportunity to bring business interests to Iran, to another country, open up the U.S. market to Iranians. Something that typically, you know, you'd think a Republican would like. Especially a big market capitalist might like. You know, like Mitt Romney, you know, Ted Cruz... You know, you'd think a lot of these guys would be into that, but no, no. It's like we're gonna, we're gonna get, we're gonna show Obama, uh, we're gonna show the you know these people. We're, no sanctions will be lifted against Iran because we hate Iran and we love Israel so much that we will basically go against our own interests to stalemate. You know this whole thing and basically make the Democrats look like like they're a bunch of idiots and it's not working all it's doing is making the fucking Republicans look like a bunch of tards that's all it's doing I mean honestly between the two uh, between all these guys running f from for the Republican nomination Hillary Clinton could beat any of them could beat all of them simply on her own merit, simply on already who she is, simply because of the work that she has done as Secretary of State. I mean, in the concept of how this is going to go, it does not take a rocket scientist, and it does not take a, a doctorate in political, in political thought to really understand where this is going. All you have to do is really un have the basic concept of political analysis, political thought, you know, and the U.S. political system. They're under the U.S. political system, for those that don't know it very well, both in and outside the U.S., we have what's called an electoral college in which you give, in which the majority of people, play, you know, vote for a particular person, in which is called the popular vote. If the popular vote comes out to be a slight majority, that is more than, you know, 50, somewhere around 50% in that particular state, then that means that that person has won that electoral college votes. Now, there are certain exceptions to this, such as Nebraska, and I think the other exception might be Maine, but most of the time, your the, the concept is, is that you get the po most popular votes in that state, you win the electoral college. Now, this does not necessarily mean that the person that wins the most electoral college votes, say there's a slim majority in which they tip the ballot just for the number enough number that they need, but they also, but at the same, but, um, you know, they can tip that in their favor, but that does not necessarily mean they've always won the popular vote. And this happened during, like, the election of George W. Bush, and it's happened, I think, a couple other times, and I think one other time was, I want to say back, 
I don't know it precisely, but it was way back, but right after the founding of the United States, and I want to say it's, it was James Madison, or I don't know. It, it was one of those guys, one of our first presidents way back when. Um, but anyway, the point was, is that this electoral college is going to probably go in, in Hillary Clinton's favor. I mean, one of the first things, obviously, that is good, one of the first few states that will probably vote in her favor will be her home state of New York, California, undoubtedly. Um, Oregon and Washington are a possibility, Nevada maybe. Um, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey probably, and there, there's many states that most that will most likely, and probably also Illinois, that will vote for her. There's not Colorado most likely. There is so many states already that we can all that we could already predict that will most likely vote for Hillary Clinton and most of those people are and that's just off and then you know we can also go into a deeper thing the democratic the the de staunch democrats are already going to vote for her that's a given the people that can be swung in her favor such as very liberal nonpartisan independents um more liberal libertarians and stuff like that, civil libertarians and such, most likely will vote for her. In fact, many libertarians, despite even their even con more conservative views, ones that favor more social policies of like gay rights and stuff like that, will most likely vote for Hillary Clinton. And in most cases, you will probably see a, a pretty good number of libertarian, you know, people and the anarcho-capitalists that will most, most likely vote in Hillary Clinton's favor. And the reason for that is because Hillary Clinton represents this this fervor of not only the social liberalism and this you know, centralism and such, she also represents a firm, you know, a, a firm capitalist line. She, you know, this boot, that very bourgeois line one that will protect certain business interests and certain and things like that one that's not in it so, and one that's not in it for the christian and not in it for primarily christian policies you know whereas libertarians basically are going to go for that they're going to go for that more business line there because being laissez faire and anarcho capitalist and free enterprise capitalist and all this different thing. Those are the people that are going to vote for Hillary Clinton because they see the direct divide that the tea and the hijacking that the Tea Party has had on their party. They have had a they have seen that how the Tea Party has what the Tea Party has just done, how it's just poisoned, sullied, and just ripped apart the Republican Party, made people fear each other. There's been purges basically from the party and stuff like that. It is. They, they know how it's going to end. And I think in 2016, and as we go further into the 2016 general election, we're going to see this divide. I think it's going to be one of those, probably the first time, and probably a strong indicator that the Republican Party is ripping apart at the seams, that the Republican Party is growing weaker, and that the Republican Party is essentially on its way out, that it's in its dying days. And what's sad is that this is the same Republican Party that used to have such a staunch approach to social policy, that used to be the that used to be the Democrat how the Democrats are today, back during the Abraham Lincoln days, like the what we like to call the log cabin Republicans. These are the people that actually are Pretty, what I've always called is the old guard. What I've always referred to as the old guard, because they represent old the the issues of both civic uh, civil libertarianism and f and this liberal conservatism, the way that the Republican Party used to be, 
and in some ways over the year, the Republican Party actually used to be the progressive party. This was way back before the Democrats, you know, this was when the Democrats were fucking fascist, you know, pro-slavery pigs and all that sort of thing. They were the, they, they were the, and the Republican Party was actually in it, was actually trying to abolish slavery, well, at least because in the North there was no real need for it. And over time, I think it was this whole, over time though, the Republican Party grew more on a militaristic and nationalistic persona. And this kind of started about during the administration of Franklin Delano, uh, not Franklin Delano, but uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who had some progressive policies, but also brought in this form of, this idea of new nationalism, this new age nationalism. And eventually that started this very nationalist sentiment, this militarist sentiment that stirred up the Republican Party and eventually was the turning point of what would have, what was technically this bourgeois progressivism of the Republican Party, in which the Republican Party turned to the right wing, and the Democrats eventually kind of started taking up more social policies, and they started, and the Democrats started leaning more to the left. Which is also kind of funny, considering that we are now seeing the Democrats lean more towards the center and towards the center right, while the Republican Party has basically now become a fascist neo Nazi entity thanks to the Tea Party. But the point is, is that we are going to see this divide. We are going to see this divide of the old guard Republicans and this t new age Tea Party fascism that has grown and, f and festered and has become a, frankly a cancer not only on the Republican Party but has become a cancer on the face of America. It has literally become the American Taliban as, well, as quoted from the newsroom but it is essentially going 2016 is I think going to be the, it should be a rallying cry should be a focal point to watch the Republican Party. It is one of those things where I think we're going to see more people that used to that used to vote Republican or people that would that would vote either Democrat or Republican depending on how they viewed the person most likely going towards the Democrat, going towards Hillary Clinton because of those bourgeois interests. I think it's really going to be one of those things where because the Tea Party, because the Republic, the GOP itself has become pretty much the Tea Party itself, I think that we are going to see that fractured divide between those that stand as the old guard and those that are of the Tea Party. Because, frankly, I, the way that the only thing that the Tea Party has going for them is Chris is this Christian theocratic, you know, Christian democracy, which collides with capitalist democracy. And just clashes with any sort of sanity, you know, any sort of sane sort of uh, any sort of sane thought process, and I think that is one of the problems that's going to face them. I mean, if the Tea Party, for some insane reason, was to gain power, it would be it would be the in it would pretty much be the end of America because America would pretty much tear itself apart. I mean, if as soon as they try to start implementing more rights on women, uh, more um, more laws on women's uh, rights, more laws on women's, you know, these um, prohibitions and stuff like that, like abortion, the more that they started to try to um, come down on the gays and uh, the gays and lesbians and the trans and pansexuals and everybody in um, the LGBT community, as soon as they started trying to come down on marijuana, which has made significant progress, most people, I think, would have enough. And I think it, and a lot of that would also come out of California, given that knowing the Tea Party, they would probably end up siding with groups like Nestle and other assholes who are trying to exploit our weakness, exploit our 
our real biggest problem, which is our drought, and trying to use that against us. And California being the rebellious state that it is, being the, you know, to the Tea Party, being the blasphemous state that it is, being the pot-smoking liberal, you know, despot that it is to them, it would, this would, you know, this is their way of trying to snuff, trying to snuff that sort of thing out. Essentially smoke, uh, smoke your opposition out. And Californians will not stand for that. We are not a people that need to be fucked with. Not when you consider that there is too much at stake in California. That we represent too much of an interest to agriculture. We represent too much of an interest to, well, to winemaking. We owe too much to the entertainment sector. In fact, at this right now, even as it drops, 40% to the entertainment sector. We represent a large portion to the tech center of the United States. The count. To the California econ uh, economy, essentially, the the state, the people of California itself represent too much to lose to anybody else. Now, frankly, the Tea Party is too stupid and into its own Christian ideology to see that, and frankly, doesn't give a damn. Their only interest is trying to basically snuff out the Democrats and gain their own party. Again, this was. A, this is the way of a fascist mentality. This is how they go about trying to push their radical right-wing agenda. But the Democrats, at least under Hillary Clinton, sees those business interests. They see the problem that California faces. There's a significant environmental problem going on. There's a significant water shortage. 25% reductions and 4 30, 40, 50 percent in some areas. This, you know, they see the problems that California faces. They see the, they see this as not only a fundamental threat to the livelihood, the 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 live, the actual lives of Californians. They see this as a fundamental threat to the U.S. economy, because if California dries up and Californians well, can't survive and try to leave in a max, mass exodus or get so pissed off that they start, you know, rioting and, you know, taking up guns, God forbid, <laughs> to get water, they, you know, that represents a threat to them. They need California because they need that tech industry. They need that entertain that 40% of the entertainment sector. They need the agriculture they need to get hammered. The point of all that being is that they need something from California. California represents one of the probably the biggest exploitations to the U.S. imperialist and U.S. capitalist sector. And that's what a lot of people understand. That's why a lot of people are going to vote for Hillary Clinton, whether they are just voting for her because they are in, because of their own interests or because of, of course, their just voting for because, you know, hey, it's I'm a Democrat, I'm going to vote for her because she's a woman. Either case may be. The point, she, Hillary Clinton represents a better the, the better alternative than Ted Cruz who, frankly, has shouldn't, I wonder how the hell he's even in the running if he's, if not, just completely shut the fuck up about it. Because one, got to be born in America and two, it's I find it hilarious how, you know, everybody spent years and is still even bitching about it to a lesser extent about how Obama was born in Kenya. But no one's bitching about how Ted Cruz was born in Canada. Right? It's like, it, it just, there's this tremendous, you know... This tremendous hypocrisy in, in American politics as well, but ultimately, yes, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, what did they have accomplished? A twenty-four billion dollar debt to the, you know, a bill passed off to the American people. Fuck them. They represent a tremendous threat to America. There are a bunch of idioids who think that they that have this ego about them that seriously 
defies the laws of physics. It defies, it defies the laws of logic. The fact that they are so arrogant and so ignorant to the idea that, oh, we're going to stop Obamacare, or we're going to defeat Obama. It's like, it's like, you know, and then they cause a government shutdown and say, heh, so we showed you, and now we're making you look like a tremendous twat because you failed to pass a budget. No, the only reason anybody failed to pass a budget was because you stood in front of a fucking podium and read Green Eggs and Fucking Ham. Who the fuck does... Again, and these are the people that you... The certain American people. And in this case, it was Ted Cruz, so, you know, San Antonio Texans. Elect, these are the people that they elected. These are the... Boo these are the people that they participated in the bourgeois system and elected. And this is what you get out of it. This childish behavior of reading Green Eggs and Ham. And frankly, I'm not surprised because that's probably the only book you can read. But it seriously is one of those things where I cannot seem to grasp, even today, the the relevancy to that. It's like, if you're going... For 24 fucking hours, this guy ran on and on and on, just talking complete and utter nonsense, all for the sake of, you know, trying to spite the black guy, but spite the guy, the Democrat that was in power. And what did it get anybody? It caused a, go a government shutdown that went on for a fucking month. It caused a later shutdown a few months later. And these are the people that get there that are running shit. These are the people. This is a person that you. Is that really a person you want in power? <laughs> and Marco Rubio, what the fuck has he done? Up until about, what, a few months ago, he was a fucking nobody. Okay, you're in the Senate. Way to go. Obama was the same, but at least Obama fucking, you know, had a law degree. And at least Obama, you know, had... At least Obama showed some chops as a leader in some ways. You know, he carried out more tortures and fucking killings than any other U.S. president, even more so than Bush. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck has Rubio done? It's like, oh yeah, I voted for... Blah, blah, blah. It's like, great, so you basically sat there with the rest of those fascist teabaggers and voted against Obama on every fucking thing. And you voted against even some of your own interests just to stalemate the Democrats. There, there's just nothing. There, there's absolutely nothing that Marco Rubio could say. Nothing that Marco Rubio has done that he will, could ever qualify him. I mean, even down to the thing that gets me, and I don't want to, don't usually bring this up, but this is obviously an issue to most Americans. Have you even served in the military? Because I didn't happen to look that part up. If he has, then wonderful. Congratulations on, you know, your service. But, the f but seriously, has he even served in the military? What have you done besides just become elected to serve for a friggin' by, you know, conservative neck of Florida. It's like, great, so you represent a bunch of rednecks in North Florida. Wonderful. That doesn't make you any... The, the, the only thing that's up in Florida are... up in North Florida are fucking gators and rednecks. That's all you've got up there. Is... Yeah, there, there's nothing that you stand for that could fucking bring about any sort that 
could bring about any sort of change, that could bring about any sort of progress, that could bring about any sort of great, any sort of great leadership, supposedly coming out of your mouth. There's nothing that you're qualified for. <laughs> and let's not even get started on Rand Paul, because Rand Paul, if Marco Rubio is doesn't, if Marco Rubio isn't even a, you know, doesn't he? is just a nobody, then Rand Paul is a fucking flea on an elephant's ass. I mean, seriously, Rand Paul represents Kentucky, a mo probably one of the most dickish, racist states in the United States, probably outside of, and that's topping Arizona, that's topping Texas and Louisiana and Alabama, and that's topping the whole South, really. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not beating them by much, but it's still up there. Kentucky is one of the most, er probably one of the, fits an oxymoron, because they have, they have smart racist rednecks, and they also have a lot of their dumb racist rednecks, <coughs> the Klan. But, uh, and there's another thing, they also, he also represents a state that pretty much is the main base of the Ku Klux Klan, or I'm sorry, the Imperial Clans of America, or whatever the fuck you're being called now. But he represents a very authoritarian right-wing voting state, a place where there's a lot of people that don't have a whole, that are not very well educated, who basically, you know, pretty much their main source of income is, you know, pretty much like what construction lumber moonshine what the fuck do you people do down there i mean seriously rand paul is is running in for trying to run for president and trying to get votes when all he's basically done is pretty much bit you know bitch about the war but then is talking about, oh, we have to go bomb, or, you know, he, he bitches about, you know, the, he stands with his father saying, oh, we shouldn't have gone to war, you know, in this country, but we have to fight against this, these group of people, and blah, 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 we have to uphold the Patriot Act, and blah, 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 and it's like, so, basically like Mitt Romney, you're a fucking flip-flopping hypocritical fascist. Okay, yeah, you're going to be a great fucking leader for this country. The only th and the only thing I can say at the end of all this is just the fact I think that the because of how weak and just how crap in general the right, the right wings arsenal is, because let's be honest, if this is the best the fucking Republicans have to offer, they might as well concede right now. Because, to be honest, as much as I can go ahead and bash them, insult them, say anything that I want about the right wing... It is pretty fucking sad and pathetic at the, when, at the end of the day when you look at it. Because if Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Rand Paul are basically... If these three fucking stooges are the ones that are going to represent the Republican Party in the primaries and possibly and one of these assholes actually representing the Republican Party in the 2016 general elections, then I really almost feel fucking sorry for the, G the GOP. I almost feel sorry for you. I don't feel sorry for you at all. I almost do. Because it's so sad and pathetic that this is what the GOP has gone to. A party that started off way back in the 1850s that stood up against slavery elected great leaders like Abraham Lincoln like Theodore Roosevelt 
and this is what the freaking Republican Party has to... And Dwight David Eisenhower. I'm sorry, there was another one. And even though I can say a whole bunch of shit about it, Ronald Reagan... Eh, I don't know. We'll throw him into the mix just for the sake of it. But at least Ronald Reagan had some integrity. And that's saying quite a lot coming from my position. But at least if you look at it from a bourgeois concept, let's even go there. Let's at least humor that idea. Keep humoring that idea. For a party that used to elect these great minds and stuff like that, this is what now they're throwing in into the mix. Like, they literally have shown that the, they don't want, that they, one, don't seem to give a fuck. Two, are completely SOL. They don't have a fucking clue where to go. It's not like they didn't, it almost is almost like the GOP is like, oh shit, the, it's like, it's like we completely forgot that a damn election is coming up. We focus too much on the congressional bullshit. It's like, yeah, we got a little bit of we got our power back in Congress, but ah, crap! Now we gotta become president. We gotta get somebody to be president. It's like they completely, over the last few years, focused so much of their attention on trying to beat the black guy, trying to beat the Democrats, trying to spite them, spite the Democrats, and make them look like the like shit, and try to get themselves to look better and put back in power. But they completely forgot that the most important part that they still have to play is trying to solidify complete and utter power at the top. It's like, okay, you've got control of the main system of, of government, the main system of, uh, of, of trying to solidify your totalitarian regime. Great, you're in the, legis you're in the legislature. You've got a majority rule in the... In the House of Reps, and you got about what, 54, 53, 54 people for the majority in the Senate, so great, you gained your majority in Congress. You still need a leader. You, it's like, you can have your Reichstag, you can have your fucking Reichstag, but you still need your fear. And you completely fucking forgot. Uh, it, it it makes me laugh because it is. It is so. At the end of the day, it is so sad and pathetic that this is all that they fucking got. I mean, I will be honest. A few years ago, for the twenty twelve campaign, you had a few nut jobs and assholes that were in there, like Michelle Bachman and Rick Santorum and. You know, Herman Cain, oh my god. And out of all of them <laughs> that I was talking about running, the, the, all these people that were running, the only people that I could say that, that I could give credit to is that Ron Paul, despite him being complete racist and stuff like that, still libertarian old guard, but you know. And Mitt Romney on a certain level. But for the most part, at least you had a couple, well, you know, you had a sparkle that was in the amount of turds that you, that you put up. At least in the 2008 campaign, you had somebody like John McCain. At least, you know, in the past, you've put up a bunch of candidates that actually seemed reasonable, that actually seemed like they could, you know, freaking get shit, some shit done, and could actually be willing to play a bipartisan field. But now you've got a bunch of, you got, you're throwing up stooges and just pretty much whatever you can find, whatever little monkeys you can find in your barrel. At this point, it is pretty much a, a safe bet that if this is all that they're going to come up with, and it's still a while away, a while away. There's probably more people that will run. 
and hopefully you'll throw a couple, uh, at least one diamond in your rough who will actually be willing to play a, a decent battlefield. But at this point, it, I think the Republican Party is a lot it is lost. I think the the old ways of the Republican Party are gone. I think that the Tea Party is basically what is left. And I think we will ultimately see that divide. I think the people that previously voted Republican or would vote either, you know, have voted either side of the spectrum, I think we're really going to see more of those people going towards Hillary and being, and being just like, these motherfuckers are crazy. We're going to go with the chick. And I'm not trying to say that, and I'm not saying that in a sexist manner. But I'm just trying to say that from their standpoint, that's most likely who they're going to go for. They're most likely going to... The Tea Party is literally pushing their constituent, any sort of constituents that they have, away from it. And those that they actually can solidify in their insanity, they'll manage to get the votes for. But ultimately, I think we're, it's going to go... I think Hillary Clinton's going to be a shoe in and I think the Tea Party understands that to a certain extent. I think that there's a lot going on to it that, you know, they throw in these numbskulls because at this point they understand there is no chance in hell that they stand. They, it's like, well, we're going to hell anyway. Might as, well, might as well throw out the most insane idiots we can and start looking like the most insane nut jobs that we can be because, fuck, we're going, we're going to shit. And just in general, they are scared because they know that Hillary Clinton is a very charismatic, likable person with the American people. She has a large percentage of the female vote already locked up, and that's probably not going to waver very much. Hillary Clinton's popular amongst women. She is popular amongst a lot of young people. She is popular... Um, she's popular, obviously, amongst Democrats. She's popular amongst Californians, which represents the most political power next to Texas in the United States. She, and quite frankly, she's going to have a lot of business interests, you know, riding on, riding on her shoulders as well. So she represents a large part of the business sector at this point for the election. And frankly, the way it, and just frankly in general, she's going she just has this persona that will most likely get her elected in the 2016 general election. And this is not trying to so much be um th this is not so much a Marxist critique I mean, you can say it's somewhat of a Marxist critique, but it's also more of a just a critique and a, a, a realization of what's going on. Now, Jason Runeru can bash Hillary Clinton all he wants and stuff like that, and frankly, to a certain extent, I most likely would agree with him. In this case, I'm not going to do. I'm not doing a video to bash Hillary. I'm doing a video to basically, and I'm not doing a video to praise Hillary. I'm doing a video to to basically bring out the realization of what's going on in the bourgeois democracy. The, in the bourgeois system, in, the, in bourgeois parliamentarianism, in the sense of, the, of bourgeois elections, Hillary Clinton is, going, is most likely going to win. And I think if we look at it, 2016 is really going to be, the, is going to be a turning point, a focal point, because the Tea Party will eventually, and the, the split in the GOP between old guard log cabin Republicans, and, you know, libertarians and such, centralists, all that crap, and right wing conservative, neo conservative, paleo conservative, white supremacist, and just in general Christian theocrats. I think we're going to see that great divide in 2016. I think it's going to come out in that election. I also think that it's going to be probably the 
beginning of what will become the Democrat, uh, a dominant party, a dominant party system, in which the Democrats will most likely probably end up holding on to power for a while. I think in general we can already we've already known that when Obama got elected, I think that was kind of what set off the the time ticking time bomb that was becoming the Republican Party and what set off this Tea Party movement. And this Tea Party movement just grew like a cancer on the Republican Party and divided and politicized the entire country. But now I think it's had time to to, to boil and you know simmer and really make people start thinking, you know, maybe I overreacted or, you know, no, I still fucking hate the Democrats. And in either case, it's, I think that divide's coming. I think it's really had time for people to come to their senses or not and, but basically pick whatever side they're going to go with. And if they don't like either side, then they've radicalized in some fashion or another. I mean, I think that in general we are going to see, I think in general what we're going to see is the phasing out eventually of the Republican Party. I think the Democrats are going to eventually have a dominant, become basically like how the United Russia Party is in um, over in the Russian Federation. I think it's going to have that effect. I think, uh, you know, I think quite honestly the um, the Democrats are going to end up becoming the regime. They're going to become a pretty much a centralist we're going to in a, in a sense become a centralist re uh, democracy, a centralist republic if, if you will because the Democrats will essentially be running and governing things for a while. Now that at least under, as far as capitalism goes. Because, again, you cannot have a Christian democracy and a capitalist democracy. It's just not going to work. You know, that, it's just, it's not. Unless you want to, of course, go completely, you know, like, the, you know, like fascism did and have Christian values incorporated into it and corporations, you know, running the country, but... Once again, you kind of can't have that because, you know, business and religion is going to clash with each other. And either way, I really don't, I really just don't see any way out, a way out of that. Essentially, the, uh, the Tea Party is, as I've said before, the Tea Party is going to be, the, is, and pretty much already has become, the death of the Republican Party. The GOP is done. If this is really what, I think this goes to show that the Republican Party is basically at its, is in an act of desperation. It's a cry for fucking help. They, they're they screwed. They're done. They, they, they don't stand a damn chance anymore. I think they sullied their fucking reputation when they fucking let the Tea Party groups in. You know, it's like, hey, look at these conservatives. Ah, crap, this is what happened now. Yeah, the, the, the GOP shot itself in the foot. They screwed the pooch. They're done. The Democrats now have are pretty much teetering on the brink. And they are pretty much... They are pretty much licking their lips at the taste of, of Republican blood. Because they know their time to rule as a governing regime is here. And we knew one way or the other that was going to be what was going to happen. Either the Democrats were going to, either the Republicans were going to fall and the Democrats control it, or the Republicans were going to keep pushing and pushing until they seized power and formed a fucking theocratic and neo Nazi regime, basically, a white supremacist regime. And either I mean, either way, you're going to still have either one of those mentalities, but it's just going to be watered down or full-fledged crap. 
and I think now it's pretty sustainable to see where this is going. I think we will also see more radicalization from the right. I think the Tea Party will eventually, once the with the GOP falling towards pretty much with the Republican Party just fading into obscurity, I think that the Tea Party will eventually become more of a radicalized, you know, group of, an, a radicalized militant group, and I think we're going to see more of a radicalization of far leftists, of sadly anarchists as well, but we're going to have see a more of a rise of socialism, we're going to see more of a rise in communism, more of a rise in revisionism and revolutionaryism. We're going to see that. We are going to see the rise of reactionism, obviously, like we have the Tea Party. There will be more of a rise in that. But there is going to be this riot, more of a rise as well from the far left. And eventually, I think that, do I really still think that America will end up having a some sort of civil conflict at some point? Yes. Because regardless of who is in power... There's still going to be police brutality and police killings. There going is still going to be issues like Ferguson and all that sort of bull crap. Capitalism is still going to exploit and murder and do what it does. And even no matter and even if it is the Democrats in power, they're still going to carry out militant uh, military strikes and other bull crap in other countries it's not going to stop it's just the whole difference of how it's handled is rather than whether or not we go to war because under capitalism we have to stay at war to continue that whole process of the money flowing through to keep resources coming to find new resources it, that's the nature of capitalism. That's the nature of imperialism. So, yes, I think at some point America is going to have that come out of it. But I think first we're going to see a pretty centralization of democratic rule. I think the Republican Party is going to eventually die off, pretty much poisoned and brought down by its own stupidity to let theocrats in and the theocrats are going to go gallivanting off and become whack at do terroristic militant uh, neo-nazi militants they're basically going to become Westboro at that point worse than Westboro frankly and that's saying quite a lot You know, I wish I could say that there's a lot of positivity that comes out of this, but either way, I just the the only the only diamond in the rough that I can say is that the lesser is that the lesser of two evils will be Hillary Clinton. It's basically trying to compare oh I don't know Hideki Tojo to Shin to uh, what what was his name Shinzo Abe. I mean, it's like, well, one was a fucking brutal fascist dictator, and another was freaking, is a freaking centralist conservative. It's like, either, it's like neither one was good, but out of the two of them, <laughs> neither one of them was good, because one was, because both were even, were both nationalistic and racist. But out of the two of them, which one was it would be better it would be better suited to run a country? Abe. It's like trying to compare. You know, what's a better example? Adolf Hitler with Angela Merkel. Well, one was a fucking white supremacist Nazi dickhead, and one's a fucking Christian Democrat. The only difference between the two is the fact that she carries a progress, somewhat of a progressive attitude in the sense of bourgeois parliamentarianism, whereas Hitler, while wanted to kill anybody that wasn't, you know, basically white, Christian, and well, German, 
so the, the it's really there's no comparison it's like between the two between the two which one would you like democrat or republican i don't really like either and frankly i think both of them could go rot in a hole somewhere but if i'm going to vote and participate in bourgeois democracy which i have not yet decided and i may not even choose to do it anyway but if i had to choose i'd go with hillary clinton in the sense of it it's basically apples and oranges really which one it's like you're picking you, you know it's always been like this but now and more than ever it's definitely is like this who is a, is better off are we better off with Hillary Clinton or are we better off with a bunch of teabagger Nazi theocrats I'd rather go with the person that that you know was responsible for Libya being a failed state and a couple of U.S. a couple of American deaths, than be responsible for voting for a person who basically mass murdered anybody who wasn't you know white, Christian, American, you know, not communist. Those type, you know, you know how I'm getting at here. And I've made so many Nazi comparisons to the. GOP to the Tea Party. I've made so many fascist comment, uh, so many comments about comparing the right wing to fascism and stuff like that. There's really at this point no need to even beat a dead horse anymore. At the end of the day, I'm if what I've said comes to light and plays out as I predicted it has. I will be standing at the tw at the end of the 2016 election, or shortly after it, whenever the GOP, if the GOP were to fold and stuff like that, I'll be standing at the end of that that finish line and basically being like, "So I guess I was right then. Good, I'm gonna go have a bottle of wine and get hammered." And frankly, I really, you know, I really don't want. To be right, there are times I really, really don't want to be right. At this point, I'm willing to th say that I really hope I am right on this one. I'm hoping that the Tea Party is the f cause of the GOP's failings. I hope the GOP fails. I hope the Tea Party fades into obscurity, and the, you know all the old guard Republicans feel a lot of shame upon themselves for ever letting these assholes into power. And I hope Americans are fucking happy with themselves for basically letting America get to this state of affairs. And at the end of the day, it's kind of one of those things as I end this video. Where it's like, there's not a whole lot of positivity I could end with it because at the end of the day, I'm still a Marxist. At the end of the day, I really don't give a fuck how America goes because at the end of the day, I'm going to be against both parties. I could gladly and proudly vote for the first female president of the United States and then the next day go off on a tangent, you know, bitching about the bourgeois system. I have no qualms about that. I have no qualms. The only reason I would vote for it is to vote stand there at the end of the day saying yeah I was a part of this historic moment and two because I wanted to spite the fucking fascist regimes that I the fa fascist regime blah, 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 the fascist regime that I saw coming basically despite the republicans that's my only reason at the end of the day I'm going to be against both the republicans I'm going to be against both parties frankly at the end of the day, I'm not going to have much nice things to say about either one of them because they represent everything that I am against. But would I vote for somebody just for out of the sense of it? Yes. Because just like with capitalism itself, there are contradictions of who we are as Marxists. And that's who we decide to side with, who we decide to fight for, uh, fight alongside until we are forced to fight against. And in this case, it's kind of that whole system of, you know, we fight fascism first and then we fight bo the bourgeois reactionaries 
second. And at this point, being able to fight against and hopefully see the fall of a right of a fascist entity like the Tea Party would be a great victory. Once Hillary Clinton was, would be elected to power, then, and the Tea Party's out of power, then and only then can we finally turn back and say, let's get this bitch out of power. Let's get this bourgeois system out of here. That is the contradiction of the thing. Even Mao emphasized the fact that we have that we have to side with, you know, the people. We have to side with our the bourgeois. With we have to side with the bourgeois in cases of fighting imperialism and fascism, and that until that is threat has been eliminated until and then we go back to fighting the bourgeois itself. I mean that is why Mao had to and the Red Army had to side with the uh, the Kuomintang uh, and other bourgeois reactionaries during during the Japanese occupation. They had to overthrow their their oppressors to get rid of the imperialists, get rid of that fucking fascism that existed. Once that threat had been eliminated, once that goal obje objective had been eliminated, then they went back to fighting the, the Nash, bourgeois nationalists, to fighting the the Kuomintang, to fighting to, to trying to throw the liberals out of power, and to try to get rid of rid of any reactionary sentiment that still existed within the country. Same with even in the Soviet Union, they had to fight against against fascism, they had to get the Tsar out, they had to get the Nazis out, whatever the case would be, before they could even begin to focus on themselves, to focus on getting rid of the reactionaries and stuff like that. Now, frankly, do I think, in the sense of the Soviet Union, that's a bad example when we compare it to fascism? Yes, because essentially the Soviet Union, well, in my opinion, went kind of a very authoritative route and completely frankly a bourgeois it kind of went its own bourgeois status route yes I really but at the, but it's all the same sentiment you had to fight against a fascist entity side with the people that were bourgeois nationalists and bourgeois liberals and whatever the case was fight with revisionists and stuff like that before we can fight against them. It kind of is that old adage that I'd like to bring up. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. To which I've always hugely ended with saying until we've defeated said enemy and then you become my enemy again and I try and I my goal is to defeat you. And ultimately, that is the that is the main purpose. My ultimate goal is defeat to defeat both. My ultimate goal is to defeat you. My ultimate goal is to eventually defeat you, but my ultimate goal is to defeat both, because I want my regime, I want my uh, views and my uh, my vision for the world for my country in power, but. The only way I can do that is by is by playing the strat playing strategy playing you know the, the essentially the art of war, and that is deception and that is in the case deception and trying to and having to side with certain people to against a common enemy and once that common enemy has been defeated then we fight each other and whoever comes out on top comes out on top. The point to all of this is that Hillary Clinton is basically the enemy of my enemy. The Democrats are the enemy of my enemy. The threat of democratic dominance and centralism is the enemy of my enemy. I have to decide with those people despite the fact that I do that I absolutely do not that I absolutely despise what they stand for. But I have to side with them to make sure that we get this fascist threat out of power, that we get this, this more oppressive 
group of people out of power. Then, once that goal objective has been attained, then I will begin, me and my people will begin the process of fighting against your bourgeois state, against your regime. And it is only through that can we actually attain any sort of any sort of path to progressivism, any sort of path to revolutionaryism. The ultimate goal is that we're going to have to fight an armed revolution. But the end result is we are going to have to side with certain people. But to get rid of a threat that still exists, even though that threat apparently seems to be on its knees. I'm Norkel Nick, leader of the Revolutionist Movement. Thank you guys so very much for tuning in for this long babble on Hillary Clinton being elect, um, being announcing her run. Uh, Rand Paul, T Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, make really whatever higher power you worship, may he or she, it whatever may may they help us all, because at the end of the day, oh my God, is this going to be a one for the history books? This this is actually an election. I think that you might actually want to just sit after you, whether you vote or not should sit back. Watch it on television, grab a tub, big old tub of popcorn, bottle of wine or 12-pack of beer, keg maybe, and just watch the insanity unfold. Because at the end of the day, that's all it is. We're just bitches on a donut run, people. I love you. You're awesome. See you next week. <laughs>